again and welcome to Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. I'm your host, certified sex therapist Lori Watson, author of Wanting Sex Again and blogger at Psychology Today and WebMD. And I have with me Dr. Adam Matthews, my co-host, who's a couples therapist, psychotherapist, and president of NCAMFT. Foreplay is dedicated to helping couples keep it hot. Each episode, we cover an aspect of sex that impacts your sex life and something that you can relate to. So if you find our discussions helpful, please give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. We would love it if you would tell a friend about us. You can find us also on the web at foreplayrst.com. And if you have a comment or a topic that you'd like us to talk about, we'd love to hear from you. Please send them to us at info at foreplayrst.com. Thanks for listening. Now on to today's topic. This podcast is part of a presentation given by Lori Watson and Adam Matthews at the North Carolina Licensed Marriage and Family Therapy Association Annual Conference. I want to tell you about the first time that I realized that I had a sex problem. All right? That's supposed to be, you can laugh, don't This is jokes. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of innuendo, so feel free to uh, It is hard to talk on. about sex and not have lots of innuendo come up. Uh, they just come up naturally, right? Yeah. So I was right out of school seen probably my first one of my first couples in private practice this was in louisiana so if you ever anybody from louisiana or visited louisiana it is deep it is like deep south right so this couple was very much your typical southern couple he was a deacon in his church they were in their 60s and they had a lot of problems with communication and resentment in in their life and in their their history of their couplehood. So they had three grown children, they were moving into retirement years, and so I attacked the problem directly as I saw it. We talked about their resentments, we had them do this big, the big push of therapy was for them to express their hurts, right? All, All the hurt that had built up with them over the years, express that hurt, talk about that, talk about the emotions behind the hurt, do a lot of forgiveness work, talk about their regrets, right? And then the big capper that was going to send them out of therapy because they started doing really well, the big capper was they were going to express their hopes for the future, right? What they wanted, right? Doesn't that sound like awesome? It sounds awesome, right? Come on. It was good. It was good. It was, it was lead them out, going out on top. So we get through all of that and we said, okay, so anything else that we need to talk about before y'all leave? And which is the absolute wrong question (laughs) to ask, right? (laughs) Um, And this sweet, sweet woman raises her hand and she said, I forgot one of my resentments last time. Do you mind if I share that? I feel like I really need to share it. And I foolishly said, sure, why not? Thinking this is not going to be any big deal. And she looks at, she looks at her husband and she says, (laughs) she says, "Um, baby, I um, regret all the time that we let another man into our bed and you watched me have sex with him. <laughs> and oh, I, uh, my, like, I, you know, the, the calm therapist face that you're supposed to have, <laughs> that was gone. <laughs> I quickly tried to regain my composure. And I, I had no idea how to, how to talk about it or how to address that. And so they, they left. I mean, we said, okay. And they left. And I realized at that moment that sex is something that I have to talk about way more than I was, right? Like it just, it is a part of the couple relationship. And I think that for the majority of us as marriage and family therapists, that we just don't do that for some reason. I don't know if it's because we're not trained. We just don't, we just don't bring it up, right? Is that your experience too? I mean, I know you're a sex therapist. Yeah, I mean, but I've been a couples therapist trained that way first and became a sex therapist, you know, sort of mid-career in addition as a specialty. But I would say, as I listen to people and supervise, you know, sex is coming up way too late in the couple session. And, and frankly, as an individual, I think, even in individual therapy, to not know your patient's sex life, you know, there's so much you don't know about them then, because sex is the embodiment of, you know, many feelings. And to not know and not ask and not wonder about sex, their sexual fantasies, what's going on in their unconscious and how it's expressed relationally, sexually, I I think you're missing a huge portion of the person. Yeah, and so there's a few reasons we want to give you that just kind of center around just to, if you're not already convinced, to convince you why talking about it is is important. The first one is, is that there is no way to really have 
a fulfilling sex life for a couple unless they are talking about it, okay? That is one of the things that's key. One of Gottman's studies found that 91% of couples who are not comfortable talking about sex are also dissatisfied with their sexual life, right? I mean, just think about that. So that's only 9% of couples can, and I wonder if they're actually telling the truth, right? And so it's a vital part if we can't help our couples be able to talk about it in a way that is valuable for them, then more than likely they are not going to have, they're not going to have a fulfilling sex life. Right. I, I joke and say that, you know, all my good jokes are about my husband and my husband's here this morning, so I don't know that I can tell all my good jokes. Only bad jokes today. (laughs) (laughs) Only bad jokes today. But I, you know, I think one of the reasons I went into sex therapy was just in terms of knowing our own inadequacies about talking about it. And I would say that many, many couples who have good relationships don't have a language to talk about eroticism. They've relied so much on just doing it or things that didn't work that they're not explicit about what they feel and think. And so, you know, to to be direct about it, and that's partly what we're trying to do in the foreplay radio sex therapy is we're trying to give a model for a man and a woman just talking mm. naturally about it. Yeah, I think um, most couples would have a hard time even saying eroticism to each other. Right. Yeah. Other reason we would give you is that emotional intimacy and sexual intimacy are intrinsically connected. You cannot separate the two. Um, you can't have one without the other. So do me a favor, let's just do a quick exercise. Think about the couples that you see and their chief complaint for that they're coming in for, right? Um, and tell me if some of these sound familiar. They spend very little time together throughout the week, right? Very little time. They tend to either become job-centered or child-centered, right? Typically, men tend to become more job-centered and women become more child-centered, but obviously that can be reversed. But that they become centered around one of those rather than centered around the relationship. They mostly talk about their to-do list, right? They seem to make everything else a priority instead of their relationship, right? They drift apart and lead parallel lives, and are basically unintentional about turning toward each other, right? Does that sound similar to some of the complaints that you hear from couples um, when they come in? Those, and those complaints, Godman found, are chief among the, the people that are reporting that they have dissatisfactory sex lives are reporting those complaints as well, right? That's, that comes out of those complaints. So the emotional, the intrinsic, the tie between the two can't really be denied. So if we're saying that we want to work on these emotional intimacy, communication problems, things of that nature, we also have to say, I recognize that when they're coming to us with those complaints, their sex life probably ain't great. Right. And I, I mean, I think to say to a couple, you know, let's work on communication for a while and not be aware that you're also working on their sex life. I, I mean, I think it's disheartening. There was something particularly you said, um, the unintentional turning toward each other. I don't know if you, if you all know Gottman, but um, that's basically if, if you're sitting at the breakfast table and you say to your partner, hey, look, the cardinal outside, your partner looks up from the paper or from the computer and says, oh, it's, it's beautiful. I wonder where the female partner is you know, of the cardinal. And it's, it's just a response. It's responding to whatever your partner is saying and giving them some attention. And I think one of the things we see is people make sexual bids as well that are ignored. You know, somebody comes up and says, you know, hey, hey, baby, it's like, not tonight, right? That's a rejection. Or, hey, hey, baby, nothing. You know, and so, so sexual bids too need to be responded to. And I think both things, both avenues. Yeah. Yeah, and then so if they're and they typically are going to present with the with the non sexual complaints, right? They're not always going to unless they are specifically coming to a sex therapist and recognizing that they have they have a problem. Most of the time, they're going to be presenting with problems in the emotional component of the relationship, and so that's another reason why talking about it is important. Another thing is just the positive contributions to relationship and to life that a good sexual relationship brings. Um, about there's there's just all kinds of health emotional positive physical health benefits emotional health benefits benefits to the couple couples that have a healthy sex life their conflict in their relationship goes down way down they're just not fighting as much and there's one study that says that it even prolongs life right so when you're talking about sex you are actively saving lives people actively (laughs) saving lives all right 
But here's the thing that I find the most interesting, is that a problematic sex life in a relationship is found to be more detrimental than a good sex life is to be beneficial. Let me say that again because that's a little bit complicated. In other words, the gains that you make with a good, in a good, healthy sexual relationship are not as great as the issues that arise and the problems that arise when the sexual relationship is unhealthy. Right, right? and I've heard, so if it's working, if sex is working in a couple's life, you know, it's sort of, they think about it about 10% of the time. If it's not working, they think about it about 90% of the time. So when it's a problem, it's a huge distractor. When it's working, it just makes us stronger. Yeah, and then there's issues about it leading to depression, increased stress, increased loneliness, just individually when sex is not, is not satisfactory. I mean, ultimately, and I think a lot of you could probably see this, is that bad sex just kills a marriage. It kills a relationship, all right? If, if that component is such a vital component of relationships that when it's not good, that ultimately, if it's left unattended, it will, it will kill the relationship. And then finally, I think one of the things, reasons why this has to be talked about more is that couples just will not talk about it on their own. A uh, UCLA study found that dual career couples talk to each other. They spend about 35 minutes a week in conversation. Think about that, 35 minutes a week. But here's the thing, they're not talking that about- <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, that's, that's true. But the thing that is even more killing to that is that they also don't talk about anything meaningful. They are spending more time talking about, again, the to-do list, the how do we get this done? How do we get Johnny to, to baseball? How do we get this thing accomplished? How do we clean out the garage? Like That's the kind of thing that they're talking about, and they're, they're not spending any meaningful time connecting. And so the last thing that they're going to talk about is something as vulnerable as their sex life. And especially if they don't, again, don't have the language for it, right? So if they're not going to talk about it with each other, they're not going to come into the therapy room and just start blabbing about, about all the ways that they want their sex life to be better and all the complaints that they have. Um, right. regarding sex that. is so vulnerable to talk about. And so people need to feel really safe doing that. And we can help them feel safe, but we want them to... I mean, I think it's not something that they would bring up themselves because most people, even who have good sex lives and good relationships, it's not safe to talk about it. So why are we not talking about it? I wanna, we want to just kind of break apart some myths about that I think we have ourselves as therapists that keeps us from talking about sex, okay? I get number two. You get number two? I mean, I, I hope you, you get all of them. I want you to get okay. feedback on all of them. All right. But the first one we've kind of hit on already, but the first myth that I think a lot of therapists have is that we, if we fix the communication, it'll automatically fix the sexual problems in the relationship, right? That if, we, if they just start talking better, that they will automatically just I fall into bed and everything will be great, right? Problem with this is that, one, it just rarely happens. One study found that this just it happens less than 10% of the time where if they fix the communication problem in therapy that they automatically fix the the sexual problem. So one, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way. But two, partly in that, we don't, you don't know, in that case, if you're not asking about it, the exact nature of what their sexual dysfunction is, right? Mm -hmm. Right. What else would you say about so, that? The uh, communication problem. Communi fix communication. I was already on number two. I wasn't listening. Oh, you're already going to number two. <laughs> no. Well, go to, number, go to number two. That's then. why people don't communicate very well. They're always waiting for, you know, thinking of their response. So yeah. number two is I should, you know, maybe refer out to a sex therapist if a sexual problem comes up in a, as a couple, you know, with the couple that I'm dealing with. And I would say sexual problems are just part of the puzzle. You know, by and large, even if you don't know how to fix premature ejaculation or anorgasmia or vaginismus, I mean, much of what I do is simply being, I'm very comfortable, right, talking about it the problem on the sexual field. And so a lot of times I'm glad to give consultations. I think it's often really important if you're connected with the patient that you also do the sexual work as well. It's simply a matter of listening carefully and asking questions and being comfortable asking direct, explicit questions. I mean, one of the things that I do do as I work with sexual problems is I ask, you know, like what really happens? I mean, who touched who, how did it start, give me the whole rundown. You know, because if I can't know what they're actually doing in bed, I can't help them think about it and fix it. Well, I think, I think too, then, when we're, 
when we start referring out the sexual part mm -hmm. uh, or the sexual issue is that we're we're modeling for the client that the two things are separate right, right? that it's a completely we're separate part uncomfortable yeah that it's a complete separate part from that. the other problems Great that are point. that are happening and so we're 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 doing more what the, more the same for them they're not talking about it cuz they feel like it's it's separate and apart from the problems that they're having and not making that connection for them i think is damaging for them um, the next one I'll embarrass the client if I ask. I think I, this was one I struggled with. I struggled with for a long time. But tell me if you've had this. I mean, I know you have had this <laughs> same experience. Is that once you open those floodgates, they really are floodgates. People just come out with it. Like they do not hold back. Sometimes to the point where I want them to hold back. <laughs> right? The amount of details that I have about my clients' parts and what they do in bed is is immense and and they're really I really have not had an experience where I've asked and then they've they've held back or felt like it was too much yeah um, I, I absolutely yeah. I, I think just the question is such a relief to couples yeah the next one my client may get the wrong idea I think we can all agree that that just that we can draw professional boundaries we're not you're not going to entice your client into a, a false relationship and you know when they when they are sharing too much and when they're when they're not mm -hmm. um you know, that's, that hasn't been an experience that I've had personally. Have you ever had that experience where some, a client started to share too much or gotten the wrong idea in that, in that Sure. Case? I mean, absolutely. I, I've had experiences of, uh, you know, erotic transference is what we call it, is when the client starts to feel sexual feelings about us. I think that it is really hard to talk intimately about our sex lives with a, another person and not feel something sexually. You know, so I, I think I'm just sort of aware of the fact that it's almost, I mean, this is going to sound funny, but it's almost an expression of sexuality as we talk about this intimate part of our lives. And so, first of all, respecting that in the other person, guarding that, but also being aware that, you know, that means sexual feelings are in the room and getting comfortable with that. You know, obviously dealing with an erotic transfer. And so if a part, you know, if a client begins to talk about their fantasies about you, I mean, first of all, you need to explore the fantasy and understand how that relates to them without being overly anxious about it. I, I will tell you a funny story. I had a patient who I'd seen for a while. I, I, he had lots of sexual problems. He, had, he was in a sexless marriage, and he had not had much sexual experience before he got married. And so he started telling me this sexual fantasy that he had about me, and he said, you know, what I think about is you're going to get up from that chair, lock the door, and you're going to come over here, and, you know, we're going to do all this stuff. And the whole time I was sitting there, I'm like, do I have a lock on my door? I, I can't, I don't think I have a lock on my door, you know? you know, which was probably my own anxious defense, right, about not hearing the, the sexual fantasy that he was having. It was like, I was just preoccupied. I can't remember if I have a lock on the door. Finally, you know, when the session was over and I got up to excuse him, I looked don't have a lock on the door. Okay, okay. And he knew I did not have a lock on the door because the way he was facing he could see the doorknob, you know. So he knew the whole time that this was truly fantasy and so. More from Lori Watson and Adam Matthews at the North Carolina Licensed Marriage and Family Therapy Association Annual Conference is coming up next on 4Play Radio Sex Therapy. Wanting Sex Again. How to Rediscover Desire and Heal a Sexless Marriage by Certified Sex Therapist Lori Watson. Each chapter is designed to fix one of the problems that cause low libido from early marriage through the childbearing years, even all the way through menopause. I've also had men read it and tell me that for them it was the most hopeful thing they read about resolving sexual problems. Look for Wanting Sex Again on Amazon.com. You can also talk to Lori Watson for therapy in person or via Skype. I offer couples counseling and sex therapy and I think about both aspects of the relationship, emotional intimacy and sexual technique and that combination together helps marriages be happy weekend couples intensives are also offered improve your sex and improve your relationship with awakening center for couples and intimacy find out more at awakenloveandsex.com awaken what's possible 
It is one of my great joys in life to be able to really help individuals and couples find strength in their relationships and really find hope again. Licensed marriage and family therapist, Dr. Adam Matthews from Matthews Counseling. I work with a wide variety of issues, including depression and anxiety, marital issues, issues with adolescence. I believe that therapy should be designed around you, that it should be personalized to who you are and to your unique situation. Therapy is available in office, online, and by phone. I want therapy to be comfortable for everyone. At our office, you'll find that we sit around a fireplace in deep, comfortable chairs, look at the problem differently, and offer practical solutions for you to take home and utilize outside of the therapy room. Schedule today and rediscover hope. You can find me on the web at matthewscounseling.net. Matthews with one T. You can contact us through email or phone and find a lot of resources on our website, matthewscounseling.net. Welcome back to Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. Myth number five, I have to wait for them to bring it up. Um, Again, we've talked about why clients won't do that. A study in the UK found with medical doctors that 95% of doctors' patients wanted them to bring up sex as part of their discussion about what was going on with them. But only 9% said that they would even attempt to bring it up themselves. So you got this wide gap between people that are willing to talk about sex and to bring it up themselves and to take initiative for their own um, sexual health. But then you got this slew of other people that want to be asked about it that are not doing that. So the initiative really has to fall on us to find ways to bring it up with our clients and have them respond to it because they want that discussion. They want that information. Right. And this is just one little thing. I think our own difficulty in bringing up sex with our patients, it it occurs to me that I also see that happening with parents and their children. You know, it's mimicked. We have difficulty bringing it up. People tell me all the time, well, I thought I should wait until my children asked about sex, and they never asked. It's like, no, we are responsible as parents, as clinicians, to recognize this and recognize that there's difficulty in bringing it up. Another myth, there is no time. The problem is so complicated. Can I just say, like, sex gives us a really clear mirror into what is going on with the clients and their communication and in their their emotions. We're going to talk some more about that, I think, when we talk about attachment styles and distance and pursuer stuff. But that is often a much clearer and cleaner route to solving a lot of the problems that are going on with the client because it's so it's so much more a physical enactment of what is happening in their emotional life and in their and in their communication. It's like right? a metaphor, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's a great I mean it's a great metaphor because and it's one that they clearly understand. So even if the problem is really complicated, knowing what is happening with them sexually can really give us a clear pathway of where to go and how to proceed. Yeah. You know, people offer what they are personally experiencing. And I think that goes for us as therapists too. Having some language, having some solutions, that's what we hope to give you today. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so those are some common myths. There's probably other ones, but hopefully we've kind of broken some ground about why we need to talk about it and some some ways to get past some of those common things that come up for us. And I I think one of those things is that when I looked at these myths, there's some that just resonated with me or that that early on these were the excuses I was using for not asking about about sex early. And I think then the question becomes, how do we begin to broach the topic? Okay, So I just want to give you a few really quick things about how you begin to talk about it in ways that are going to lead you to some of the stuff we'll talk about in a minute, a ways to start to try to fix it. But one is just, I know this may sound obvious, but it's just to ask directly, do they have any sexual concerns? I know that some people have that just even on their initial assessment. And I have some clients that put it down on on their initial assessment, some clients that won't. But I always want to ask specifically, do you have any concerns about your uh, sexual life that you and your partner are sharing? Um, That's just a very simple way. If they don't want to talk about it, then they get to say no. But but more often than not, there's something that is happening that they want to be, that they want to be different. uh, And I would say if you don't ask that question, you will lose at least one of the partners and, and... I might be jumping ahead here, but I think that that question has to be asked with, within two sessions. I mean, probably the first session. There might not be time for it, but just to say out loud, you know, um, one of the things we're going to talk about is how you relate together intimately and physically and 
what your sex life is like, you know, do you have some concerns right now about that? Because that is something that is so deeply important and sometimes to one person, I mean, I would say the most frequent issue that we're dealing with in, in sexual problems is one person wants it more than the other. So the other is quite content to not talk about it and not bring it up. And the first who may have already been labeled, you know, you're, you want sex too much, all you want is sex, you know, you're a perv, they don't want to bring it up because they are afraid, you know, maybe that's what the therapist will think too. You know, maybe I want it too much or I, this is too important to me and this is a professional, you know, I don't, I don't want to reveal my very base primitive wishes. Yeah, and, and you set up, by asking it early, you set up the expectation that it's going to be a part of therapy and it makes it much easier for them to talk about. I think the other thing you mentioned that I would just highlight is that, you know, before we were talking about all the different things that the couples come into therapy for, that they identify as their presenting problem, most of the time it's the partner that is not dissatisfied in their sex life, um, the one that's not pursuing it, right, that's, that's bringing the couple into therapy. And so the one that does have a problem um, with their sex life, um, they're the one that's being almost being dragged to therapy sometimes. Not all, not all the time, but sometimes they're being dragged to therapy. And so another reason, when you talk about losing one of the partners early on, I think that's one of the, the yeah. dynamics that's at play there. Okay, number two, just talking about their sexual history and just exploring with them how that has been for them, how that's developed um, between them as well, kind of gives you an idea of the ebb and flow of their sexual relationship. Because um, I think oftentimes you find out where, just like other patterns in their relationship, you kind of find out what are their, they say, well, we were, our sexual relationship was fine, we were really satisfied until, you know, three years ago, and then it just kind of fell off the map. Well, then you get to go, well, what happened three years ago? Oh, uh, well, we had twins. Well, of course, all right, that, that start, then we can start, to, they, most of the time they're not going to make those connections. So exploring that with them, I think, gives you an idea of how it's been, where it's gone, and what are the, kind of the, the ups and downs of that for them, whether they've and ever had We, a, we had twins because we were infertile. We went through a year and a half of fertility treatment, which, if you don't know, is a killer for sex lives because it's on a timetable, and you know all of that can start to emerge. Right? Yeah, that, you can just add in more detail because those kind of details start to come out when you can see this is when things dip, this is when when things fell off for us. Hear more from Lori Watson and Adam Matthews at the North Carolina Licensed Marriage and Family Therapy Association Annual Conference on upcoming episodes of Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. Thanks for listening. Hey, help us stay on top here at Foreplay. We'd love it if you would subscribe and share it with your friends. And please take one sec and rate and review us. Thanks so much.